Thanks. How are you? I have uh, my work cut out for me. I need to follow non-lethal force and birds and sex. So good luck with that. I thought I would start by getting the remote to work. Failing that, I will sing. <laughs> if Anne is still in the audience, we could sing happy birthday to Anne. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Whether that was Anne or whoever else, much appreciated. <laughs> At some point this will catch up, maybe or maybe not, but let me begin by telling you more or less how we die, uh, or at least I'll give you one, one version of those events. That's a normal EKG. That's the EKG that hopefully all of us in the audience have going on right now. Oops, this seems to have a life of its own. I didn't do that. I have to turn it on. I also have to find the on button. There, ah, good. Off to a flying start. Can we try this again? So, death. <laughs> Let's talk about death. Excellent. This is a normal heart rhythm. Um, you can see a little, what's called a P wave there. That's what happens when your atria contract. Then this big thing called the QRS complex is what happens when your ventricles and your heart contract. And then the T wave right there is what happens as your heart sort of resets itself and gets polarized, repolarized for another, another spin through the, the cardiac cycle. And if all things are going well and you all are alive with heartbeats, your hearts have gone through a dozen or two dozen of these cycles in the time that I've, I've been talking. And that's kind of what you, what you want to see. What you don't want to see is this, which is a rhythm called ventricular fibrillation, which is, as you can see, a little tiny sawtooth pattern in which the ventricles of the heart and to a lesser degree the atria of the heart just wiggle. They don't contract, they don't move blood, they don't move blood through your lungs to oxygenate it, they just kind of quiver. And that's a rhythm your heart can't tolerate for very long. You've got maybe five minutes, 10 minutes tops with that rhythm, during which time your lungs aren't getting any blood, your, uh, your, your brain isn't getting any blood, and pretty soon, if that's not corrected, either with medications or with a shock, you wind up with this which is called asystole, which literally means the absence of a heartbeat, the absence of a rhythm. And that means you're pretty well on your way to becoming dead. This rhythm is important because that's your chance to bring somebody back from the dead. When you see that rhythm during a code, during a cardiac arrest, that's your chance to return a normal sinus rhythm. Lose that opportunity, let it go for five or 10 minutes, this rhythm turns into this rhythm, and pretty soon you're dead. So time really is of the essence, and that's a lesson we've learned from television programs for, for years. If somebody isn't brought back from the dead in the first five minutes or so, in the space of a typical commercial break, you know that person is probably a goner. And so as far back as when I was in medical school, what I was taught was that you had five or 10 minutes at most during a code, you deliver a couple of shocks, you deliver mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, you deliver a couple of medications like lidocaine or epinephrine, five, 10 minutes at the outside, but if you haven't succeeded in bringing that person back to life, you might as well give up, or at least that's what we were taught. Well, that's what we were taught for a long time until this little girl made headlines. So this is Michelle Funk, and Michelle was two and a half years old when she fell into a creek uh, outside of Salt Lake City in Utah and drowned. And as you can tell from this headline from JAMA, the, Amer the Journal of the American Medical Association, she was underwater for a little over an hour. When rescuers pulled her out of the water, she was not breathing, was not moving, had no signs of life and no heartbeat. That's the point at which many paramedics would say, she's been under for an hour, remember what I said before, about five or 10 minutes, we should just give up. But for some reason, they didn't. They tried to resuscitate her, they gave her medications, they gave her CPR and chest compressions, they put her on a breathing machine, 
um, they tried to rewarm her and they tried to bring her back for another two hours. So a total of three hours with no heartbeat, no breathing, no signs of life. And at the end of that three hours, finally, she, her heart began to beat just a few beats at first in a regular rhythm and then more normally. About an hour later, she started to breathe on her own. About four days later, she woke up and talked to her parents. Three weeks in the hospital and she went home and she just got married um, two years ago. So it's stories like these, and this is one of the most dramatic, but not the only one, that have gotten a lot of researchers thinking very, very critical, uh, critically about what the future of resuscitation might hold. That five or 10 minute rule, what if that rule is really an hour, or two hours, or three hours? Or what if that rule is six hours, 12, 24, several days? What's the limit? How far could you let somebody go before you can't pull them back from the edge of death anymore? This was really a quantum leap beyond which nobody thought it was possible to go, but rescuers managed to bring Michelle Funk back, and not just bring her back, but she came back able to go back to school, live a productive life, get married, have kids. Um, this is not somebody who was just on the edge or living in a vegetative state. This is somebody who did really, really well. And so if she could have that happen to her, what, what's possible for all of us someday? That was really the last step or the most recent step in a long history of resuscitation that's been going on almost for 300 years. And that history started in Amsterdam, <clears throat> which many people would say is the, the birthplace of the science of resuscitation. Um, back in the 1700s, a group of, of Dutch got together and formed the Amsterdam Society in favor of drowned persons, which seems like an odd name, doesn't even make a good acronym. Maybe it's better in Dutch, but it was a group of people who were distressed by the fact that many of their fellow Amsterdam citizens were falling into canals and drowning, and they decided to do something about it. And so they began trying all sorts of weird techniques, um, some of them very weird, to try to bring back the dead. Well, what did they try? A better question is what they didn't try because they tried pretty much everything that you can think of. Um, they would use bellows, like you'd find in a fireplace, to stick down the back of somebody's throat to breathe for them. They would use uh, a feather to tickle the back of somebody's throat. Uh, they would roll people over a barrel, hoping to replicate some of the normal motion of breathing. Uh, my own personal favorite, which you can barely see here, uh, they would also uh, throw drowning victims over the back of a trotting horse. And I confess in researching the, the book that you heard about in the introduction, I decided to try that technique. And I will tell you, it's exactly as unpleasant as it, as it sounds. So <laughs> don't, don't try that. It's not, not recommended. We've really come a long, long way, um, way, way, way beyond uh, horses and, and feathers. And one of the most recent advances in the science for resuscitation is you. It's me. It's, it's all of us. One of the biggest advances in the science of bringing back the dead is not what happens in an operating room or uh, an emergency department, but what, it's what happens in college campuses, in Boy Scout troops, in nursing homes and middle schools. It's a lot of people who are getting trained in the basics of cardiopulmonary resuscitation. I bet if I were to do a poll in this group right now, at least half of you, if you're a typical college audience, at least half of you will have had some training in CPR, which means that if somebody has a cardiac arrest, if any of us have a cardiac arrest right now, we're probably within arm's reach of somebody who knows how to perform CPR. And that's really done amazing things to uh, increase our chances of survival in the setting of a cardiac arrest. Not just survival, but our increase our chances of actually doing well. And one of the more recent advances, uh, and one of the, the factors that's been most important in improving all of our chances of surviving a cardiac arrest, is this rule that the American Heart Association put together a couple of years ago. They were aware that many of us, despite our best intentions, aren't willing to do CPR with somebody um, because of squeamishness over the whole mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation thing. We may know that's the right thing to do, we may know that CPR saves lives, but we stand on the sidelines because we don't want to do that or we're afraid of, of doing it wrong. They realize that and they realize that the whole mouth-to-mouth -mouth thing, unless you're a trained rescuer, doesn't really help and might hurt. So they changed the guidelines 
to use what's called hands-only CPR at a beat of about 100 beats per minute. All you need is two arms and a sense of rhythm to save a life. And so that's what the American Heart Association has started to promote. And that by itself has probably done more than anything that's happened over the last 10 or 15 years to, to save lives. If you're wondering what that 100 beat per minute rhythm is, this is the answer. For those of you who are familiar with that classic of the 70s, that rhythm is exactly the rhythm you want to try to follow when you're performing CPR. The problem, obviously, is that the typical cardiac arrest scene, the only one who's old enough to remember that classic from the 70s, <laughs> is probably the one who's lying flat on his back without a pulse, <laughs> who's doing a very difficult job of staying alive. <laughs> but we've actually come a long, long way. Um, these numbers, depending on what age range you're in, may not seem particularly large. Overall, chances of survival somewhere between 1% and 30%, and that's a huge range, depends on who you are, what kinds of medical problems you have. Certainly, as you get older, your chances of survival go down, partly because older brains aren't as plastic. Older brains don't do as well with insults of not having oxygen for 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes. And honestly, one of the reasons Michelle Funk did so well is her brain was still growing. It was still developing. She still had room to, to make uh, neural connections around uh, neurons that had been damaged. Those of us who are in their 40s, 50s, 60s don't have the benefits of that. And we have other medical baggage, too. We have other medical problems. But still, in that age range of 30 to 70, or potentially even lower, those are survival numbers that people, even 10 or 15 years ago, could only have, have dreamed of. The other big advance that's come, again, within this broad uh, rubric of, of crowdsourcing, are automatic external defibrillators, which are present all over the place, including at your library, which I witnessed yesterday. Um, these AEDs are present all over the place, and they essentially turn any one of us regardless of medical training, even if you've never run a code before, you've never been to medical school, you can actually put these pads on somebody's chest, hopefully after they've had a cardiac arrest, not before, um, and shock them back to life. They're even foolproof enough so that these devices will sense what the rhythm is. They won't administer a shock if you see a normal sinus rhythm. They will administer a shock if it's a rhythm that's, that's shockable. And what we found is that your chances of survival after uh, a cardiac arrest are about 10% if you just get CPR. With an AED, that survival goes up to about 25%, and maybe as much as 40%, or a little bit less, if that AED is handy. And again, those are numbers that are an order of magnitude, literally, than what we were seeing even 10 or 15 years ago. That's great, that's neat, but there are two problems that I wanted to get you all thinking about. One is what I've learned to think of as the, the munchkin coroner problem. Remember in The Wizard of Oz, when the Wicked Witch died, you knew she was dead because you had the munchkin coroner who appeared and announced that she was really, truly dead. There was no room for debate or argument. You knew that she was a goner. But remember the story that I've laid out for you. Five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes was the rule, and then Michelle Funk came back after three hours. So when is somebody really and truly dead? In the setting of a cardiac arrest, if I'm called to, to do a code at our hospital um, and I'm in charge of figuring out both what drugs to administer, when to administer shocks, and when to stop, you tell me, when do I stop? Do I stop after 10 or 15 minutes because that was the conventional wisdom? Do I stop after 30 minutes because I did take care of one patient once who came back after 30 minutes? Do I go for three hours? Because I know of the story of this little girl outside of Salt Lake City in Utah who came back and did well after three hours. Or maybe I'm more optimistic. Maybe I should keep going for three and a half hours or four hours. When do I stop? You don't know the answer to that. I don't know the answer to that. And nobody else does either. It's something we're all trying to figure out. And it's a tough question because we know that if you go to an emergency department that runs codes for longer, you're going to do well. The longer you run a code, the more the chances are that you'll be able to bring somebody back. Not huge, and those marginal gains get smaller and smaller and smaller in that tail as you go farther and farther out, but there's still a benefit to an extra minute, an extra five minutes, maybe an extra 10 minutes, maybe an extra hour, who knows? That's problem number one. 
Problem number two comes from Greek mythology. Some of you uh, for whom this is not distant history as it is for me remember, may remember that Tiphanes was a mortal who was dating Eos, who's the, the goddess of the dawn, uh, which is a pretty good deal, honestly. You're a mortal, you're dating a goddess. Most guys would have been happy to leave it there. Um, but Greek mythology tells us that, that uh, Tiphanes was more ambitious, more greedy, and he asked Zeus for immortality. And so Zeus said, yeah, sure, immortality, no problem, chuckling the whole time as Greek gods are wont to do because what Zeus realized and what Tiphanes didn't figure out is that Tiphanes asked for immortality, but he forgot to ask for eternal youth. And so Homer tells us what happens as that unfolded. Essentially, Eos uh, watched him get older, sicker, weaker, more frail, and I'm taking poetic liberties here, but essentially locked him up in a room and threw away the key, uh, which is a little harsh if you ask me. Um, and that's one of the problems that we're starting to see as we get better and better at CPR and resuscitation. It's relatively easy to restart a heart. If you have basic skills in CPR, if you have an automatic extrapital defibrillator handy, you could restart a heart of the person sitting next to you if that becomes necessary. But what we can't do, what we still haven't gotten good at doing, is curing the underlying diseases of dementia and heart disease and emphysema, all the things that cause that heart to fail in the first place. And so we're embarking on this weird journey in medicine these days in which we're getting better and better and better at restarting hearts, but we're not getting concomitantly better at curing dementia, curing cancer, curing heart disease, curing emphysema. And so we're creating this population of patients who I often see as a hospice and palliative care physician who are getting older and sicker, like Tiffany's, more and more frail, who keep coming back from the dead but keep coming back from the dead to a quality of life that many of them, frankly, wouldn't have wanted. And that's the question I'd like to leave you with. I wish I had an answer, uh, but, I, but I don't. Thanks to crowdsourcing, CPR is easy, it's getting easier. It's getting easier and more effective every day to bring people back from the dead. But stopping CPR, for the same reason, is getting harder. It's hard already and it's getting harder. I don't know when to stop. I don't know when to say to a patient, look, if I were you, I would probably not want to be resuscitated. I don't know how to say that. And most patients that I take care of don't know how to say it either. And so my plea to you is, I don't know the answer as a physician. I've worked as a palliative care physician for 15 years, taking care of hundreds, if not thousands of patients. If I don't know the answer to that question, then the answer will be on all of you to figure out what that answer is for you, what that answer is for your parents, and what that answer is for your grandparents. Because that's not an answer that's gonna come from physicians, no matter how smart we are, whether we have uh, uh, professorships at, at academic institutions like the University of Pennsylvania, that's up to you. So I would encourage you to think about these questions, talk about them, talk about them with your parents, with your family members, with your grandparents. Think about what makes life worth living, what makes that life worth coming back to, because ultimately you're the ones who are answering those questions, not me. So please take a moment and think about that, talk about that, the answer's up to you. Thanks. <laughs>